Yes, so thank you very much for having me. Uh, I, I will be quite fast, so don't stop me. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about experiments. So I'm from the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen. I'm, uh, we also have this Max Planck Center with, uh, on complex fluid dynamics with the University of Twente, which is an internationalization of the Max Planck Society with other institutions. So they could be pretty much any other university. They are on different topics. Um, so I'm, I'm running this laboratory for fluid physics pattern formation by biocomplexity. And I would like to show you first what I don't talk about which is this, which is the Max Planck turbulence facility, it's just a big wind tunnel where we use sulfur hexafluoride to make really high Reynolds numbers. Um, here, just to give you an idea, this is the Taylor scale uh, Reynolds number. This is the typical length scale of the flow divided by the common Wurf length scale, which you always have learned about. And nowadays with our wind tunnel, we can go from all the way down here to all the way up to here, which is pretty close to atmospheric levels, which is kind of nice. The nice thing is in this tunnel, we can just change the density alone. And just by changing the density alone, all the geometry, everything stays the same, but we can just change the inertial effects. That's all. And this makes it very nice because no, usually you can't do that. You have to change also the machinery and everything. But here we can actually compare this. Recently, we have started to measure acceleration in this wind tunnel. So we do, currently we use Kobo cellulose beads, which is basically the dust that you put on your face not to be shiny. And that works very well. Since we use SF6, it doesn't burn, so we don't have to worry about explosions. And uh, here's a, a, this, an acceleration distribution function. But this is what we have currently, our very preliminary data on the acceleration, up to R lambda of about 4,000. So these are the first measurements ever up there. This is the last, this is the numerical simulation, so far they go now. We have another factor of four on the logarithmic scale. I mean, factor of four, period. Then we also do rayleigh Venard convection. We've heard about this today. Uh, this is our current incarnation. So this is a complicated experiment, as you can see here. And this is just a, a, a convection experiment, where the, which is about 30 centimeters wide, a meter high, a little higher than a meter, and five meters long. And the, the question there is, how important is the, the pattern formation or the large-scale circulation in these systems? In other words, what are the turbulent superstructures of the systems, like large-scale circulation? Currently, we just find two rows in there. That's it. So we haven't found the six, seven row state. We just find two row states. But I don't want to talk about this. I want to talk about the Max Planck cloud kite. And uh, basically, we're interested in all the cloud questions that you have had before you already. Um, so we are interested, basically, trying to understand clouds better, trying to understand why rain initiates, trying to understand clustering trying to learn more about clouds in general and the climate in general and also the meteorology that goes with it. And to do that, we go actually into the field. Um, this is why, why my title was in situ measurements. So we have so far, we have done four campaigns. One of them is the Eureka 4 or Eurek 4 campaign, which some of you, I think, were possibly even partners in, I think, right? Um, and so there were lots of ships and so on. And then here you see our Max Planck kite kite. We have 145 hours of measurements, the mini MPCK until it flew away and was never to be found. Uh, we have 52 hours. Then we also measure on the mountaintop of Zugspitze. This is the tallest mountain in Germany that we have, and we measure there directly in the, basically on the mountain in the boundary layer. And then in Finland, we are flying into the clouds in Palastruni, which is basically the Palas Lake, and which is 300 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. So this is the the end of the Baltic Sea, and then over here is uh, the measurement station. Um, so we're having a lot of fun. Uh, here's the Zugspitze. All I wanted to show is that we are here on the mountain. We have a sled where we can drive with the wind, and we can do 3D particle tracking on there. So we can actually measure the particle distribution. And the way we do it is we have a, a uh, this should be a video, I think, yeah. So here we have the system, which could be driven with a cloud. Then we have a 300 watt laser with a very nice illumination volume. Then we have three high speed video cameras at 15,000 pictures per second. And then the nice thing is when you look at this paper or you take this QR code, you will find a paper where we are now able to use this three dimensional imaging. If I talked about this a long time ago when I was here, now we can actually measure the particle size also. And now suddenly we can measure the Stokes number and suddenly we can actually do some really interesting physics which otherwise we couldn't have done because the tracking alone doesn't give it. You need to know the size of your particles and the density. And so this is just a typically, typically experimental runs from August to September. 
And this is the sort of mean diameter, which is defined up here. So this is we saw roughly the size of the particles that we had in these different experimental runs. And then, of course, you can measure the radial distribution function. And sure enough, it goes up and you can fit. And you can look for this vector C1 here. In this formula, we corrected this from the paper from Lenz Shaw to introduce this vector of A, which takes into account that it could go to 1, the whole system. It doesn't just go to 0. And then Jan Molacek, who was, is the primary investigator here. So this is the data from a paper by Lenz Collins. And they said that the C1 should scale like this. And we find a pretty good agreement. And this Stokes number difference is the Stokes number between different particles. So Stokes number 1 and Stokes number 2 could be different. It doesn't have to be the same Stokes number. So we, we start to really get into these things. We're really starting to get roughly, I put this line 0.2, 0.2 here because it's pretty close to actually what the numerics gives you by doing the simulation that Lance was doing at the time. But now I would like to go to the real part of my talk. Um, I should have had spent only five minutes so far. That's very good. And so I would like to talk about this, the Max Planck cloud kite. So the idea was we, the, the, the problem was we were measuring on the mountain and we published our first paper and the metrologist said, well, this is all wonderful and nice and great and, you know, do it and, and, but it's not a cloud. And we said, no, no, it is a cloud because we're only looking at the small scales and so on. But then, of course, there's always the question of entrainment because you do not know what air you entrain from the mountain. And of course, the air entrained from the mountain could be very different from a real cloud. And we found something, we published a paper on cloud voids where we found that there's little holes in clouds which are about five centimeters across, three centimeters across, and we could associate them to vortices. Remember in turbulence, we have these things called worms, which were fashionable in the early 90s or middle 90s, late 90s, and then they disappeared. But there are these worms, and we associate that with these long coherent structures which you find in a turbulent flow. And we could show that this is all okay. But then again, it was in the turbulent boundary layer. Who tells you that this was not a horseshoe water shed from the mountain and had no particles in it, and therefore you should see it again. So I decided we have to do something else. And I said, let's just see whether we, some, I was at a conference and somebody said, don't you know about this company in Great Britain who builds these Haley kites? And I said, wonderful, but we have to lift 100 kilos, not only 10 kilos. And so we talked to him, uh, he's near Salisbury in England, and he said, look, you know, if you send me enough money, I'll build you a big balloon. <laughs> and and we, 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 we built the first prototype. The prototype was later sold to the ETH. So that's our prototype that they are flying. Uh, the papers don't say that, but it's what was built because of me or us. Um, and so this is this big balloon. And the nice thing about this balloon is actually a kite. It's a dream come true for a kid. If the wind stops, it doesn't fall down. It actually goes even st steeper up. Okay, but if you put enough weight on here, it falls down. Uh, this is the one problem that we have. And so what we do is we don't only fly one of them, we fly actually two of them on top of each other to get more lift. And so as long as there's wind, this thing will pull up to the highest we've measured so far is one ton on the line. So you have to imagine you have a line which is about six millimeters and you have one ton of tension and it vibrates like mad, you know, like when you were kite flying, it goes like and initially it's scary, but later you forget about it. And of course, it's not like that. This is what they allow us at, at the Institute to fly 30 meters. That's the highest we're allowed to go. This is pushing things a little bit. Um, and we have to have a safety line. And then we made an instrument box and I just show you this quick video here. So this is the instrument that the big instrument that we are flying. And the idea was to put a PID, high speed video camera in there, then to build an inline holography system. The PID works on green light. So the PID, the light will come down here. We will look at a sheet of light here. Then we have the holography system. Of course, then we need a lot of computers. This was a laser Doppler system, which we don't fly anymore. Um, then of course, we have to measure the meteorological pro properties, humidity, temperature, everything that we have to know. Velocity also, this is not optimal because we are very close to this bluff body here. And then we have to cover everything up to make it rainproof. Then we have a fast cloud droplet probe over here. And then of course we need a beam stop to make out of this class four laser a class one laser to be allowed to even fly it because otherwise the, on the ship we wouldn't have been allowed to fly a class four layer. So because if, if the laser would not be blocked at about a kilometer distance, you would still lose your eyesight. 
So we have actually a camera there that always looks at this beam stop to make sure it's there so, because we shouldn't lose it. I will show you that it works uh, in a moment. And so here I show you briefly what we do. So this is the launch. So here's the experiment. Um, the data I talk about was flown like that. So it had the aerodynamics of the balloon around it. Uh, there's not much space. The ship crew didn't like it very much initially. At the end, there were only four guys coming up and said, oh, yeah, we can do this, no problem. Um, there is a very strong uh, von Karman Vortex Street behind the ship because of the chimney and all that stuff, and so you have a lot of motion. And you can see you try not to hit the ship. You don't try to hit the other side, but then so far we have had no accident. And there it goes, and you just let it out. I can speed it up perhaps a little bit. I don't know. It takes a little long. Let me just move it. There it goes, right? So now it's out. This was on the next morning. It was still out there. Uh, they require you for one guy to be up all night. It's very hard. I was scolded because I looked like I was asleep, but <laughs> I'm not so sure. Um, and then here's when it's landing. So this can be quite interesting. You see, um, you have to bring this instrument in without it being damaged. And bang, there it is, all fine. And then you have to hold down this monster balloon in a, in a really five meter per second wind. So it's, it's, it's a real talk. But usually it's like this, you know, here's the balloon. And you just watch it. It's down there. It's very quiet. The instrument is on the balloon. Well, it goes into the cloud. You tell it to, we have it on automatic trigger. It automatically measures, then turns on the PIV, the holography, or the other measurements are running all the time. And then, you know, after a while, it comes out of the cloud again. Now, just to show you that the PIV is safe, this is a, this is a video from, from Palace. And so what you see here is a lamp that tells us where the balloon is, and the green thing is the PIV laser. Yes? Could you remind us how high it goes? Well, it goes, we can, so far we have been measuring between 1.5 kilometer and zero above ground. Uh, you know, zero is when it's on the floor, and then 1.5, but we, there's no reason not to go to, with two balloons, we can probably go to 2.5 as long as we have enough line. The problem is you have to go about 1.5 kilometers, you have to let out about three kilometers of line because it will hang through just like a normal kite, uh, actually. And, and, uh, but it can be done. And so here you see the video. This, I like this video a lot because it tells us that the laser is actually safe. So this is now the PIV going at full blast. Um, so, so this PIV is actually running at a rep rate of 35 hertz. So the iPhone can't do that. And that's why it looks a little bit different, but you can see here very nicely. We're actually in a cloud in, in, in Finland it was a very low cloud. And that's why we could take a picture from the ground. Okay, so let's just keep going. And so we, we did this uh, campaign here. We were on two ships. Uh, the small kite was on this one. The big kite was on that one. We have 20 flights, uh, 10 flights on the other ship. We have 200 flight hours in total. We have 500,000 PIV images. Just to tell you that we have, they, they're all in clouds and we have 900,000 holograms that we have to analyze. Now I talked to somebody and said, we need deep learning algorithms. Now you understand why. Because analyzing 900,000 PI uh, holograms is hard. Here's a typical measurement. So here is the attitude. So this is flight number 18, over which I will talk. So we go up, then we sit there for a while. We have some cloud droplets coming in. And then, so this is the mean diameter of cloud droplets. Up here, you know, we have events where we have a mean diameter of 15 microns. And I will talk about this little event up here, which was nominally stationary. We talked about this, so the wind, depending on the wind, the balloon will go up and down a little bit. We have to correct for that, but there's nothing we can do. Uh, it just does that. The motion of the ship seems to be dent by two kilometer line very, very well. So you, the, the line doesn't matter anymore too much. And then this is the same measurement of the same cloud with radar from Claudia, from the University of Cologne, which was on the ship. And so this is the radar reflectivity. And so in, in DB, and this is where we did the measurements. And so before we went through this thing, and then later we went here, but this is the measurements that I've chosen to show you. And just to show you what the turbulence is, well, you know, here in this case, what we can do is we can make calculate a second order structure function from the PIV images. And it turns out that's the best way to do it. So here the Taylor microscale made Reynolds number in that cloud was about three and a half thousand. The energy injection scale was 0.07. It's even very close to what you actually were saying it would be. And uh, the Kolmogorov time scale is 50 milliseconds, and the Kolmogorov scale is about half a millimeter. These were the typical numbers we had last week. 
by the way, so this is nothing out of the ordinary. And uh, of course, just to show you what happens in inline holography, so here, what you see here is the particle. So this is the, actually, I have to look. I can't read it myself. Uh, this is the particle density in uh, exactly, and the other one is the is just time uh, in minutes in UTC over here. But this does it all for you. So this is the hologram. Let's call it zero. This is the next hologram, which comes in at 75 hertz. This is the next one. We are very slow because we are a balloon. We are not an airplane. And so what you see here is that in 15 centimeters, we basically go from the cloud edge to a fully, what we would call a fully developed cloud. So this is, we heard this morning, the question of shear. <laughs> I don't know why this thing is so sharp. Shear might play a role in there. I don't know. But it's extremely sharp. And so let me just show you the actually. So the particle size distribution in the cloud looks something like this. So you have about zero to, to 25 nanometers. So here the particle is coming. We're flying in the cloud. Actually, remember, this is each image, each hologram at 75 hertz. And then bang, we're in there. And then 0 0.17, 0 0.2 seconds later, the cloud already thins. Then we go back in a really dense region. Down here are the Stokes numbers, the equivalent Stokes numbers. And so we are really sitting now on a lot of data which needs to be analyzed. And we, let me just show you uh, this one. This is then a PIV image. So this is before the cloud. These are the giant meteors. So these are these cloud droplets, which are about five microns, and they're just always there. Three minutes, well, I have to really speed up. And then what you see is we have this PIV data. So this is the PIV data. We can do a tessellation of that. We can analyze this tessellation. And if you have a random, so we correct our data. This just shows you that our data is actually has biases from droplets on the lenses, things like that. We can correct for this. This is just a random mean, uh, but by a random process. So this is the tessellation where this is the area divided by the mean area of the thing we have, we have measured. So this is just a simulation of what you get when you have a totally random process. And what we measure in the first experiment is this. So we see that this is our data. Uh, we, we have a deviation of the data. And now we, the specialist can think about where this data deviation is from. And you should ask me in the question period, because I'm not allowed to explain it to you now. Uh, this is the next one. So this is yet another one. So again, roughly at the same height. It's this cloud event here. This tells you where we were in the Atlantic. So if you know the coastline, you could tell uh, this is a little bit south of Barbados. And this is the radar measurement. And so it's actually this guy here that we are looking at, at 1,000 meters. So we look through here. OK, this is where the turbulence is most likely the highest. This is the, the particle size at a second interval. And you see, this is what you always see as a background. This is always there, always. You can measure all the time. There's no cloud. There's just this haze. You can see this haze all the time. You see the haze, you know, pouring, just sits there, you know two, three, four particles in a second. And then bang, you come in a cloud. And bang, 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 and then you run off scale. So this is not good. I should make another another plot. And so here's the same thing again. So I did this because down here it looks like nothing. But it's actually there all the time. And then you run into the cloud. And now you see the cloud event in full class. So I might overdraw by one minute. So. And so what you see here now is it's going to go into the cloud at any moment now. It's the same movie as before, but now going up to 400 counts in a second. In this FCDP, this golden instrument that was there measures a very small air, volume of air. And there, this is the particle size distribution that we have. So let's analyze it so we can do a tessellation. I don't show you what we have done. And then for this cloud, it looks very, very different. For this cloud, it lies totally on our simulation data when we normalize by the average. And on this guide, it's below the theoretical prediction, what you get for a random process for this very small particle size of, um, you know, over here, which is, is roughly uh, 10 microns or so. So it's very small particle size. So if we have two effects. We have this and that. Now you ask yourself, how could it be, right? This side is also different, but it's clear. But here we clearly saw a different going from one behavior to the other behavior. So where's that from? What you can do is you can plot this out and just take out the random process. 
And what you see is that this data follows pretty much the same for large surface areas in the tessellation. So these are particles that are far apart. But when they get closer apart, you get basically are exactly on the theoretical, on the random process curve. And then suddenly we have this and that. So we suspect that this might be the effect of charging. We can't show that uh, yet. I have more slides to show. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eberhard, for a very impressive talk. Uh, that's a wonderful facility, quite unique. Uh, I'm sure there will be some more questions. Yes, please. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Thank you, that was very interesting. I wondered on the kite whether you have um, uh, updraft measurements, updraft, downdraft measurements, because that sharp boundary that you showed uh, is quite possibly uh, a result of this um, shell, the, down, the, the shell around the edge. Well, of the we, we, we have made similar measurements with a, you know, with, a, with a thing hanging in the cloud, and then we get the same very sharp boundaries. But, uh, you're completely right. There is a, actually the velocities are modified because of the of the experiment itself, but also the balloon could have basically a velocity going. Measuring really the updraft velocity, we have measured it, but it probably doesn't tell us that much because the balloon is in the way, right? Clearly, so so measuring eddy covariances will be hopeless with this setup if as long as you're at the balloon. And so nowadays we go basically have the line. The balloon is way up there, and we just hang it in the line, go down 30 meters. And then we have this instrument hanging all by itself in the cloud. This is the data now from, from, uh, from Finland, but it was on the 19th of September, and we don't have much, haven't much done that much analysis yet. But, but I expect it to be as sharp. It's what you see is actually you see, I had shown this tessellation. You see basically a big vortex, which is in training for two images, which is about uh, a 30th of a second, so two 30ths of a second, one 15th of a second. You see basically entrainment and a bang you're in it. In that measurement. I mean, modulo, stuff flowing around the balloon and so on. But I don't think that the balloon has much of an impact. Mm. Although we are sitting right at the balloon. That's why we got away from the balloon in the, in the future measurements. Good, thank you. I think Michael had a question. I was going to ask whether you see uh, any effects of electrical discharge in any of your instruments? No, so we had a, okay, so we have electrometer data uh, from the ground. Uh, we had one time a charged cloud, we know that, but we don't think it's that one. We have to, the data, we couldn't, this is all fresh from the press, so we have measurements, we have a lightning detector, there was never a lightning detected whatsoever, but we had some high electric fields once. So there clearly were charged clouds around, because where would this large electric field come from? It was so high that we actually were hiding on the ship. We told everybody to go away from the line because we were afraid there could be some lightning coming. After all, you have this long lightning rod, right? Um, so, so uh, one thing we have, we have actually we have been talking to Ray about this to, to build a small device that could measure deflections of charged particles with high-speed imaging, because that one you can do easily. You put a high voltage up there and just see whether you could actually measure the deflection of the droplets, and then this way. Currently, the problem is we have the RDF of this. Uh, I don't know, did I put it in? Yeah, so the RDF of these two, this is the RDF, so this is the, this is just the distance function. So this is what the, the fast droplet probe measures for case one and case two. In case two, where we see this funny effect, you know, that's below, we see clearly that there is a scale of about 10 to the minus four meters, so 100 microns where something seems to be happening. But we, from the PIV, we can't tell right now because the radio distribution function actually co goes, collapses, but this could be because we lose resolution on the data. So I wouldn't, oh, that's why I don't want to even show it. So Freya Nordseek actually made the analysis just for me and I didn't put it in because I was afraid if I show it, then you think this is real, but it might actually not be real. We don't know. Right. Uh, yeah, I was a little bit surprised at some of the dissipation rates because these are just fair weather cumulus, right? I mean, Pardon me? Dis energy dissipation rates for the yes. turbulence? Yes. Some of them were really high. high. Yeah. Well, uh, so this is something I've asked my guys too. 
Uh, it could actually have something. Who said it that the, the airflow around the tunnel could play a role? Because the fluctuating velocity might be modified by that. Um, the energy injection scales, you get two different answers. So if you take the second order structure functions, you get only like five or 10 meters, which is very low. If you take a, a correlation function, where you try to fit a correlation function, then you get more like 100 meters, 150 meters, which would be more close to what Steve was proposing. Well, Steve even said a kilometer. So the, the fluctuating velocity is relatively high. Um, the, we, we intentionally flew into turbulent regions of the cloud. So we, you know, we always took the radar and then said, where should we go? And then we went up to about a thousand kilometers is good. By the way, for those of you, if you ever fly one of these, don't go down when the bad weather comes or down trough comes or rainfall comes. If you go down, your balloon is guaranteed to be washed away. Um, the, the reason is that the, the falling rain produces such a strong gust that the, the, the balloon will suffer like mad. If you keep it up there, it's just turbulence, you know, nothing happens. And the balloon we lost was because we parked it at 300 meters. And then it left, it was about 250,000 euros of damage. Jeff, you had a question? Okay, all right. No, you have to hit the button there, this one. Yeah. Thanks. Do you, do you see cases, do you have cases where your balloon crossed a whole cloud from, from left to right? So you could see the skin, the interior, maybe go Well, through. we have, we have that, right? So the, the PIV, I mean, the PIV can run, I think, for 20, no, PIV can run for three hours. So we can do the whole thing for many, many clouds, no problem. The holography, I think we can run for 20 minutes. So as long as we go through the cloud in 20 minutes, we can measure, we have that. Okay, and did you see differences between the skin of the cloud, the first few days? We haven't done that yet. So we, we are still in the process of doing this. You know, we have this 150 terabytes of data. I mean, we have a total, we have one continuous flight. What that means is we had this instrument and a smaller instrument. And what we did is we flew this instrument for three hours, then we took it down took up a small instrument of the six hours, we brought the other one down of 16 hours. So we went through the whole day night cycle. And so we have the full atmosphere for a whole day night cycle. So this is really, I mean, we're sitting on something that we need to analyze and make sure it's true. Um, and, and, and I can only encourage you, if you guys, anybody here, experimentalist who wants to work with me or theorist on the data analysis, you're, be my guest. Uh, we hang your instrument of the balloon, it flies, you do your measurements, you know, we publish a data paper and, and, and out it goes. So, so this thing, the nice thing is you can really park this instrument. And of course, with all the nastiness of the wind and the motion and so on, but that one we can nowadays measure relatively easily. On land, it's even better because on land, like in Finland, so this whole system was made for the sea. So we did all the communications ourselves. We did everything ourselves. Everything was done through our radio systems and so on and so on. On land, you have cell phone towers and you have amazing cell phone. You can put an iPhone on there and measure inertial force. I mean, the opportunities on land are so much better because the communication is done by somebody else for you. And so we're just switching the communication base for this balloon for land so that we probably can even do real time readout, not of the holography data, but the other stuff we can just bring down real time, you know, like the fast cloud droplet probe, we could just stream down over an LTE or, you know, 5G line, no problem. Which you, if you have to do it yourself, you it's real effort. Did, did you have a question? Oh, it's, answered. it's answered. Okay. Do we have any other questions? It's time for one more. Cici, yes. Uh, one quick question: the um, the job precise distribution that you showed that even outside the cloud there was some constant haze. Do you think it's a sea salt? Aerosol or some kind of other evaporated well, this, this, this rain? Must be, these must be giant cloud aerosols, so these must be giant particles. We were very surprised to see them all the time, night, day, they're always there. The frequency might change, but they're always there. So five micron activation, very rare, right? I mean, I, have this, I can show you PIV videos where we see them. They're real. We can even know how far they are apart. And also the holography, they show up. But they're just there, what can I say? It's always there. And it surprised us a bit, but then we talked to metrologists to say, what are you talking about? You know, these are just giant nuclei and blah, 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 blah. 
Um, but I'm, I'm very happy to talk to the specialists because, you know, we are really moving in uh, kind of from the side, from, you know, coming from a wind tunnel. It's a bit different, you know. Um, but I would be very interested in talking to you. I will be here, by the way, until the 8th of December. So if anybody is here for a longer time, just come to my office and we can talk for hours, also look at data. And with Zoom nowadays, we can talk to the whole group in Göttingen and see some other data if you want to see some. Somebody who asked me, somebody asked me what happens when we get out of the cloud, what's in the middle of the cloud. We could look at that while I'm here. Okay, thank you very much. Well, let's thank Iwahad again for a very nice talk. Uh, I hold this for Elena, so. Okay, next one. Yeah, I know. Uh, Ella, you